civil wars leave nothing but tombs. If there was ever a quote that so succinctly expressed the carnage that such an event leaves behind, this is it. The five-year-long, bloody conflict between the northern and southern United States led to an estimated 620,000 casualties, with a more recent study approximating closer to 850,000. Nothing but tombs, indeed. And at the conclusion of one particular battle, a tomb, of sorts, was prepared for and purportedly filled by a fallen Union soldier. Almost three decades later, though, he was found alive. His name was William Newby. This is his story. In 1825, or thereabout, at the base of the Cumberland Plateau in rural Smith County, Tennessee, William Newby meekly made his debut. He was born into a strikingly run-of-the-mill family, with no fame or fortune. You couldn't have picked him out of a crowd of Middle Tennessee and newborns. The only noteworthy event throughout Newby's boyhood was when he and his family moved from Tennessee to Illinois, the state where he would marry his wife, have children, and call home. It was also there where Newby would enlist in the Union Army, joining the ranks of Company D, 40th Illinois Infantry on August 8, 1861, at the outset of the Civil War. Little did he know that the following April, a string of events would occur that would impact him for a lifetime. William Newby found himself back in the state of his birth in 1862. The Battle of Shiloh began when Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston led his battalion in an ambush against Union troops commanded by General Ulysses S. Grant as they were en route to Corinth, Mississippi. The two armies engaged in battle near Shiloh, Tennessee. The Confederacy pushed with all its might, attempting to pin Grant and Co. against the Tennessee River. However, the Union's sheer manpower was enough to resist the push and quickly rise victorious, if you can call it a victory. The Battle of Shiloh was brutal and served as an eye-opener of just how costly the war would be. Over 23,000 soldiers died in the two-day struggle, the most in any battle of the war to that point. Our 16th president summed it up. War at the best is terrible, and this war of ours, in its magnitude and in its duration, is one of the most terrible. When the dust settled, among those presumed dead due to a gunshot wound to the head was none other than William Newby. This wound occurred at some point during the 48-hour brawl. Eyewitness accounts from multiple fellow soldiers confirmed that Newby, after being shot down in the line of fire, writhed in pain before crawling to a nearby tree on which he propped himself to wait for the inevitable. Due to the location of his injury and his gut-wrenching screams, his comrades knew he was a goner. Sadly, they did what they had to do and left him on the battlefield to succumb to his wounds. Two days later, those in charge of burying those lost in battle were on the scene. Despite the warm, heavy rains during the interim, the crew identified the body of William Newby under the same tree he reportedly crawled under. There was a bit of confusion, however, as some of those on duty who knew him closely said that they didn't find Newby's body at all. Odd. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of the ridiculous mess this would eventually turn into. In spite of the varying accounts, the United States government officially declared Newby dead from the injuries he sustained on the battlefield. Thus, his family mourned and lamented the loss of a beloved son, husband, and father. Inevitably, time healed as many wounds as it could, albeit leaving some scars, and the family tried to move on. But while a stitch in time saves nine, a stitch by time just might be ripped out 29 years later. In the newbie's family's case, that's exactly what happened. Fast forward to 1891, when Hezekiah Newby, William's son, received word that some men near McLeansboro, Illinois encountered an intriguing individual. According to the men, this wanderer looked just like William Newby. Hezekiah soon found himself in a poorhouse near Carmi, Illinois, face to face with the man. Upon calling for William, the man stepped forward. The markings and scars visible to Hezekiah made his head spin. They were just like his father's. Upon returning home and informing the family, 
they agreed to trace him down once more for a thorough investigation. When they found the man again, they were shocked to determine beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man was indeed William Newby. How did they know, you ask? Newby's brother, who was closest to him in age, knew that William had two unmistakable identifying marks from his childhood, a deep scar on his left foot from an axe, and an injury to the bone of his right leg sustained from being kicked by a mule. Upon examining these areas, the precise scars mentioned by his brother were found. When asked about how he got the scar on his foot, the man replied, I cut myself with a broad axe when I was a boy. As he continued conversing with his family, the man continued to state things that only Newby himself would know. This left the family astonished, yet convinced that they had found their long-lost soldier. This turn of events leaves us with more questions, though. How was Newby, if it really was him, who supposedly died in the Battle of Shiloh 29 years prior, still alive? What actually happened to him after he was left for dead on the battlefield? Where had he been all these years? In the minds of many, the first question can be answered quite simply. As it turns out, there was another soldier in Company D who just so happened to closely resemble William Newby. His name was High Morris. Logically, the assumption is that due to the muddy, dimly lit environment that burial detail had to work in, they mistakenly identified the body of Morris as William Newby. A tragic, yet quite possibly unavoidable mistake. The second and third questions were answered by Newby himself. According to him, near the conclusion of the Battle of Shiloh, Confederate forces captured him and sent him to the Andersonville POW camp. While there, presumably due to head trauma from the bullet wound, he suffered from severe memory loss. Beyond this, others in the penitentiary observed strange, erratic, and straight-up crazy behavior from Newby. This, paired with the fact that no one there, including Newby himself, knew his name, earned him the title Crazy Jack. Newby himself would later explain, I was known by the name of Crazy Jack, and I laid in the filth and ditches. I went naked with an old yarn gray shirt tied around my waist. I was not myself there. I was crazy as a bedbug and had no sense at all. After the war ended, Newby was released from Andersonville. So he returned to his family, right? Wrong. Remember what he said about being crazy? Yeah, that hadn't worn off yet. Neither had the memory loss. Newby actually spent the next 26 years wandering throughout the southeastern United States, creeping out the locals wherever he showed up. Anyway, with those loose ends nicely tied up, let's reshift our focus toward Newby's family and their response to finding him alive. They, like all good Americans, enjoyed nothing more than seeing justice served with a nice, fresh side of liberty. And to them, it only seemed right for Newby to receive the back pay and pension he was due as a war veteran. To boot, they weren't asking for much. Only $20,000 total. Surely, considering all that the family had endured, the U.S. government wouldn't think twice about giving the hero the reward he rightly earned. Nope. It actually turns out that $20,000 in the late 1800s was worth around 500 grand today. The government said Newby was dead almost 30 years ago. There's no way they were about to shell out $500,000 to a dead man. That's where this story receives yet another wrinkle. Daniel Rickety Dan Benton was born in Illinois in 1845, and, funny enough, moved to Nashville, Tennessee with his family soon after. The moniker was coined for Benton due to him having rickets as a child, a disease that adversely affects the limbs and balance. Due to Rickety Dan's wobbly, limited mobility, he was never able to find an occupation upon entering adulthood. So, he did the next best thing, become a vagrant horse thief. After spending the majority of his time wandering from one poorhouse to another, eventually he was sentenced to prison time in Nashville after being found guilty of said equine thievery. How does this guy have anything to do with William Newby, you ask? Oh, you'll see. Shockingly, when William Newby went to Springfield, Illinois to claim his pension pay, he was quickly taken into custody and jailed. Government officials believed him not to be William Newby at all, instead claiming that he was none other than Daniel Benton. They then charged him with attempting to fraudulently take another man's pension. In their eyes, 
they had caught old Rickety Dan red-handed again. All that could be hoped for now was for a trial to prove who he actually was. This guy's luck was just unbelievable. On July 11, 1893, the trial finally began. Two of the men on burial detail directly after the Battle of Shiloh testified that they had indeed buried the body of William Newby. There were some 70 witnesses that stated the man claiming to be William Newby was actually Daniel Benton. The odds seemed stacked against him, but maybe they weren't. More than 140 witnesses testified that the man on trial was indeed William Newby. Doctors were brought in who, after examination, determined that the man had clearly never suffered from rickets. Even Newby's 95-year-old blind mother went to the stand to defend her son's honor. Obviously, she couldn't see him, but knew based on conversational evidence that this man was her son. So, no. The odds weren't stacked against him, but it turns out the court itself might have been. After all evidence was shown and testimonies were made, the judge gave instructions to the jury. Despite all of the nearly undeniable evidence to support the fact that this man was William Newby, the jury convicted him, or should I say Daniel Benton, as guilty of committing fraud. It only took them 20 minutes to reach a verdict, and regardless of how fishy the courtroom smelled, it didn't mask the pungency of the two-year jail sentence that Newby now faced. His appeal for another trial was later denied, and he ultimately served the term. But what happened after his release may be the saddest and strangest part of the story. Upon once again becoming a free man, William Newby didn't go home. He didn't go reunite with his wife and children. Crazy Jack went back to doing what he did best, wandering. And he didn't go just anywhere. He found his way back to where he arrived after his death, Andersonville, Georgia. Soon after, William Newby passed away and was buried in a potter's field. The end of his life was no different than the rest of it, unfortunate beyond belief. Some questions still remain, though. Remember High Morris, the man who many supposed was the actual person buried after the Battle of Shiloh instead of William Newby? There's one tiny issue with the two men. Although their appearances were strikingly similar, there was one major difference. Newby had sandy hair and blue eyes, while Morris had dark hair and dark eyes. Despite all of the evidence pointing to the man that Hezekiah Newby found being his father, that man had dark hair and dark eyes, like High Morris. How does that add up? I have one possible answer that I'll share in the comments, so look for it there. Another mystery is in regard to Rickety Dan. If the man on trial was actually William Newby, as most of the evidence supports, what happened to Daniel Benton? Where was he? What had become of him? I suppose your guess is as good as mine. In the end, the story of William Newby is altogether hapless and miserable. One tragedy led to another, then another in his life. So, if nothing else, I hope this video can help bring some balance by way of recognition to the legacy of the man affectionately known as Crazy Jack. The Otago Daily Times, a New Zealand newspaper covering the story, concluded it like this. There is a strong possibility that he is Daniel Benton. There is a possibility equally as strong that he is William Newby. If he is Benton, then the government would have lost $20,000 through fraud. If Newby, what a golden opportunity to reimburse this 19th century martyr for his wasted life and the injuries received while in the service of his country.